have your Bibles this morning, I would like to ask you to please turn to the book of Genesis. I would like to read from Genesis chapter 32. Lord willing, we'll read verses 9 through 12. Before I begin to read and study, I would remind everybody that God's love for us is greater than any love that any of us can comprehend. We sometimes read about the love of God. Sometimes we sing about the love of God. We sing the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. And that's true. We read about God loving us so much that he gave his only begotten son to save us from our sins. And I can't comprehend God loving us so much that he gave his only begotten son for us. The Bible says that God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So understanding and comprehending the love of God is something I don't think we're able to do and will not be able to do until we get to the eternal heaven. I think then we will fully see and know and understand the magnitude of the love of God. Our love fluctuates But God's love does not fluctuate. God loves us just as much today as the day that he gave his only begotten son for us. The Bible says that God has loved us with an everlasting love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because God loves us, everything that he does for us is for our good. It's for his glory for our good there are times that I might doubt the love of God because terrible things are happening in my life and I might begin to wonder because the devil will tell me God doesn't love you or else this wouldn't be going on in your life but the more I know about God and the more I know about the word of God the more I realize that because God loves me God does chasten me. God will bring me to my knees. God has the power to do anything to bring me to my knees and to bring about conversion in my life. The scripture says in the book of Psalms, Thy people shall be willing in the day of my power. When God begins to manifest his power, God begins to carry out judgment in my life, I'm then ready to do whatever God says. And I pray that God will help us to know that God's love for us is eternal and that the things that God does in our lives, they are for our good and they are for his glory. Reading now from Genesis chapter 32, the word of God tells us here about Jacob. The Bible says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And I certainly understand how God hated Esau, but I do not comprehend how God could love Jacob. Neither do I understand how God could love me or you. But God did love Jacob. In spite of all the ungodliness in Jacob's life, in spite of him stealing his brother's birthright, God still loved Jacob. God brought his judgments on Jacob. Jacob suffered severely for what he had done. And then Jacob began to feel great grief and sorrow. And Jacob began to repent because of the judgments of God in his life. And because he felt conviction because of sin. And when God began to bring his judgments and he felt the conviction of sin. Jacob truly repented. And when Jacob repented, the only one that knew for sure that Jacob had repented was God. You see, I can look at you and I can think you've repented and you might not have repented at all. Uh, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So I can do things that make you think I've repented and I haven't repented. On the other hand, you might truly repent and I might think you haven't repented. But God knows your heart. And so we as a people of God, we need to pray that God will help us to know and understand 
that God is all wise and God is perfect and God is righteous in all that he does. Reading now from Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 9, the word of God says, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Now, that was going to be extremely hard for Jacob to return to those people that he had mistreated and, and had, had been very ungodly in their presence and they knew all about his ungodliness and yet God said return, return unto thy kindred and I will deal well with thee. You think it took a lot of faith for Jacob to do what God told him to do? Do you think that there were kindred and people that doubted Jacob's sincerity when he returned? No doubt there were. You know, a lot of times in the Word of God, we have numerous examples where God saw repentance years before man recognized the repentance. There were many people that came to John the Baptist to be baptized of him as John the Baptist was preaching, repent. There were many people that came to him to be baptized and John the Baptist called them, a, many of them, a generation of vipers. And he told them to go and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. But see, God can read the heart. God knows whether or not a person has repented. The only way that you and I can tell whether or not a person has repented is if they're bringing forth fruit, meat for repentance. Until that fruit is brought forth, you can't tell for sure whether or not a person has repented. That's the reason a person can walk down the aisle and say they want to be a member of the church and until that member or until that person has brought forth fruit in their lives and the body of Christ can say we recognize this person is definitely a born again repentant sinner, the church cannot receive them. We've had people that have been high on drugs on Tuesday that have walked down the aisle on Sunday and wanted to join the church. We've had people that have done all other kinds of things that, that during the very week prior to them coming down the aisle, they were certainly not bringing forth fruit. When you plant a garden, it takes a while to get the fruit. Sometimes it takes a long time before you ever see the fruit. And we as the people of God, we need to understand that God may see my repentance long before my brethren may see my repentance. So God saw Jacob's repentance and God forgave Jacob long before his brethren ever forgave him. In uh, verse 10, after God says, I will deal well with thee when you return to your country and to your kindred, when Jacob acknowledged the unworthiness that he felt, he said, Genesis 32, 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I have passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. Had his brother forgiven him yet? Had his brother forgiven him yet? No, his brother hadn't forgiven him. Why hadn't his brother forgiven him? He had not seen any fruit meet for repentance. He said, I pray thee from, I, do, I pray thee, deliver me, I pray thee from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he will come and smite me and the mother of the children, mother with the children. And thou saidest, here's what God said to Jacob after Jacob has repented and is going to return to his kindred and to his country. God says in verse 12, And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. I want us to think about that six words in verse 12 where God says, I will surely do the good. I believe that applies to every born again child of God. I will surely do the good. God 
has surely done us good, hasn't he? We sing the song sometimes, the Lord has been so good to me. He has been so good to every one of us. And because God says that he loves us with an everlasting love, because I can look back in my past and I can see many times the Lord has done good to me, I can state as God said to Jacob here, God said, I will surely do thee good. I know that in the future in my life, God is going to do good for me in the future. I know that one day God's going to take me home to be with him forever. And that's the most wonderful, marvelous thing God has ever done or will do for me. Is to save me from my sins and take me to glory when I leave this world. But I also know that while I live in this world, God has given me commandments and teachings in his word. And he has told me that when I follow his word, he will do me good here. He will bless me. If you go home and read Genesis chapter 28, you'll hear what God says to his people. He says, if you'll follow me and you'll keep my commandments and you'll do the things I say, I will bless thee. And he talks about in the first 14 verses, one blessing after another, God promises to his obedient children in Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. And then this is in Genesis chapter 28, Beginning in verse 15, going through about verse 64, God says, But if you do not follow me and keep my commandments, I will curse thee. God is speaking there to his people that he loves, and yet he says, I will curse thee, and I will bring my judgments in your life because you are not doing what I tell you to do. You see, that's the thing that causes us to be perplexed sometimes is because God brings his judgments and we don't understand how in the world God could say, I will surely do thee good. Because sometimes it looks like God is doing us bad when we're getting chastened by God. But God is doing us good when he is chastening us. It's not bad. It's bad for us while we're going through it, but it is for our good that God chastens us. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chasteneth. That word chasten means to discipline severely. And whom God loves, he does discipline. And if you're a child of God and you walk contrary to, when I walk contrary to God's word and God's way, God chastens me. And I experience the judgments of God. But when I do what's right, I feel and know, not just because God's word says, I will surely do thee good, but I experience God is doing good things for me. God is blessing me. God is helping me. In all of your lives, I think many of you could stand up right now and say, God is blessing my life. And I want you to know when you're doing what's right, God will bless your life does not mean you'll never have trouble. Job had all kinds of trouble while he was doing good. But God was with him in his troubles. And in the midst of all of his troubles, Job knew that if he never experienced another joy in this life, he still looked forward. He says, though after these skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Did he know even in the midst of all of his troubles, did he know God was going to bless him one day? He says, I know God will surely do me good. I think the 23rd Psalm is full. I think every verse in Psalm 23 is an expression of God will surely do me good. Turn and look in your Bibles at Psalm 23. And I want you to think about this statement from Genesis 32, 12, where God says, I will surely do thee good. I want you to look at Psalm 23, and I want you to see that in Psalm 23, in every verse, God is saying, I will do you good. Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1, God says, the Lord, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, brethren, when the Lord is your shepherd, it's because you are one of his sheep. And when you, as his sheep, when you do what's right, he blesses you. 
And he comforts you and he provides for you and he does everything that you need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That statement, I shall not want, is a declaration of one of the six words from Genesis 32, 12. What are those six words? I will surely do the good. Do you believe that the Lord is your shepherd? Do you believe that because the Lord is your shepherd, I shall not want. I will never need, and that word want doesn't mean just to desire something, but it means that you have need of something, and you will never have need of anything as long as you're walking in obedience to the teachings and commandments of God. The Lord is your shepherd, and you shall not want. That's a wonderful blessing to be able to feel and know and say, I'm going to not worry. If you're worrying, it's because you do not believe those six words that God says. What are they? I will surely do the good. If I don't believe those six words, I'm going to worry and I'm going to fret and I'm going to be upset. And I'm going to be trying to work things out myself. But I believe the Lord is my shepherd. And I, if I believe that he will surely do me good, then I can put everything in the Lord's hands and wait on the Lord and trust in him because he does love me and he will do what's right. He will surely do me good. Do you believe that? It's a great blessing. He will do you good. In the second verse of Psalm 23, after he says, I shall not want, he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Is that doing us good? You know, the first part of that says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know, sometimes sickness, God will flat lay you down on your back. He will lay me down. And when God lays you down, now there are a lot of different ways that can be applied, but one of the ways is he will lay you down in sickness. And when God lays you down in sickness, sometimes you'll find out he laid you down in green pastures. And by laying you down, he brought you back closer to him. By laying you down, the only thing you can do is look up. And when the only one you can do, the only one that you can look to for help is God, when you're laid down, you're going to remember God is in control. And God said, I will surely do thee good. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Is that doing you good when he restores your soul? When, is your soul? when does your soul need restoring? When you're sad, when you're weak, when you're weary, when you're faint, when you're about, when you're cast down, your soul needs to be restored. And God does restore our souls. He surely does us good. Verse 3 says, He restoreth my soul, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Listen, brethren, as God leads us in paths of righteousness, if we follow in those paths of righteousness, He will surely what? He will surely do us good. But if we walk contrary to His word, He will still surely do us good. But we won't feel like he's doing us good. We'll feel like he's doing us harm. But that harm, that chastening is for our good. He's still doing us good. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. One of the great blessings that I have and you have as a child of God is to know that God is with you. God is with you. And he will surely do you good. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Have you ever felt the comfort of the Holy Spirit? That's God doing you good. Verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Is that doing you good? When you have enemies, when you have people that hate you and despise you and would do all manner of evil against you falsely for Christ's sake, 
Does God still bless you and prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies? He says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Now listen to verse 6. He says, Surely, what's the next word there? Surely, goodness. Now what does the text say in Genesis 32, 12? I will surely do thee good. Now what does this say? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew the same thing that Jacob knew back there. David experienced many of the, of the same things Jacob did. Jacob did wrong and he repented and eventually God forgave him and eventually most of his brethren forgave him. Likewise in David's life, David did what was wrong and when he repented and when he repented and when he repented and when he kept begging and he kept praying, God finally forgave David but the sword never departed from his house. And eventually some of David's brethren forgave him because they eventually saw what are the five letters they eventually saw? Fruit. What do we have to see? Fruit. What does God see? God sees the heart. And then you have to wait to see the what? You've got to see the fruit. Psalm 34. Just turn a couple of pages in your Bibles to Psalm 34. I want you to listen very carefully to Psalm 34 verses 6 through 10. We're talking about God says, I will surely do thee good. But I want everybody here to know and understand that God has done us good. By saving us from our sins, God has done us good. By giving us good parents, God has done us good. By giving us good companions and children, God has done us good. By giving us the church and blessing us to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ, God has done us good. By giving us his holy word and blessing us to be able to read his word, God has done us good. By blessing us to know and understand much of the truth in God's word, God has surely done good to us. Psalm 34, listen, beginning in verse 6. Psalm, verse, Psalm 34, verse 6. God's going to listen carefully. In these verses of Scripture, God's going to tell who, will, who He will manifest His goodness to. I'm going to say that one more time. In Psalm 34, verses 6 through 10, God is going to tell us who He will manifest His goodness to. And He will manifest His goodness to those that fear Him and those that trust Him and those that serve Him. That's who God will manifest His goodness to. Watch this now. Fear Him, trust Him, and serve Him. Psalm 34 beginning in verse 6. The Lord of God says, This poor man cried. The psalmist David is talking about how he cried to God. He's this poor man that he's talking about, who is that poor man David's talking about? He's talking about himself. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. That salvation is not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about the troubles and the problems and the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions that David had. Who is it that had saved David every time King Saul had tried to kill him? Who is it that had saved him? It was the Lord. It was God. Who was it that saved David when he went against Goliath? It was the Lord. The Lord surely did good to David when he went against Goliath. The Lord surely did good to David when he get, went against the Philistines. The Lord surely did good to David. And he said, I cried to the Lord and he saved me out of all of my troubles. Verse 7 says, the Lord, now listen carefully, here's a conditional promise. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that, what are the next two words? Fear him. Now how can you tell whether or not, you know a lot of people, I hear people say all the time, well I fear God, I fear God. <laughs> how can you tell whether or not a person fears God? Okay, by their fruit. Keeping the commandments. If you're not trying to diligently, if you're not diligently trying to serve the Lord, if you're not keeping the commandments of God, 
then you do not fear God. God tells us that in His Word. It's only when we are keeping the commandments of God that we show that we fear God. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. When I have wisdom, I'm going to know God is in control. And God is not going to let me do contrary to his word without me experiencing the judgments of God. So the Lord encampeth round about who? Them that what? Fear, fear him, verse 6, and, uh, verse 7, and delivereth them. What's that word delivers? The same as what in the previous verse? Saves, verse 8. He says... Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that, what are the next three words? Trusteth in him. What did he say you had to do in verse 7? Fear him. What did he say you have to do in verse 8? Trust in him. Are you a blessed man when God, when God helps you to trust in him? Absolutely. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his, his saints, for there is no want. To them that fear him. There is no, what does that word want mean? See the word want has several different, the English language is very difficult to understand sometimes. There is no want, what does that word want in this verse mean? Need, that's exactly right. Need, you're not going to need anything. There is no need to them that fear him. You won't need anything. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not Want. What does that word want mean? To need anything. You're not going to need anything. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all your needs will be taken care of. Verse 10 says, listen carefully to verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. Listen carefully now. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any. What are the last two words? Good thing. Well, why? Because when you're seeking the Lord, and when you're trusting in the Lord, and when you're fearing the Lord, and you're keeping the commandments of God, God is going to surely do you good. Go into Psalm 73 now. I want you to see that sometimes, listen carefully, sometimes the people of God who are doing good and are keeping the commandments of God and they're trusting in God and they're fearing God and they're trying to do what's right sometimes the people of God who are doing the right things sometimes they have great trouble and in Psalm 73 if you've never read Psalm 73 if you've never studied Psalm 73 I encourage you to go home and read Psalm 73 starting with verse 1 and come down at least through verse 17. Study it. It'll be valuable to you the rest of your life if you'll learn what's in Psalm 73 verses 1 through 17. I'm going to just, for the sake of time, come down to verses 12, 13, and 14. The writer here is Asaph, one of the psalmists, and the psalmist Asaph says in verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Have you ever seen the ungodly prospering in the world? Have you ever seen them increasing in riches? Have you ever seen them going through life like there's no problem in the world? They can commit adultery. They can lie and cheat and steal. They can do anything they want to, but they don't suffer. How? How? This is what this man's going to say. How is it that the ungodly can prosper in the world? He says, verily, listen to verse 13. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. Had this writer, had he been obedient to God, cleansed his heart, washed his hands, served the Lord, trusted in the Lord, feared the Lord. He says, verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in its innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. This writer says, I look at the ungodly and they are what? They are prospering in the world and they're not having trouble and I'm trying to serve the Lord and I'm having trouble. And he's saying, it's not fair. And he said, I did not understand. If you go read all the way down to verse 17. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I there what? There is an end. Did you know there's an end to every one of us? There's an end to us. Your life is going to end. My life's going to end. And when this life is over, those that have never been chastened of the Lord 
And the only ones the Lord chastens are His children, whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. And if you've never been chastened, if anyone is not chastened by God and lives ungodly, but they prosper anyway, you need to understand they're going to die and go to hell. That's their end. Those that are children of God are chastened by God here in this life. Those that are not children of God are not chastened by God in this life. Those that are not chastened by God are called bastards in the word of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 6, 7, and 8. They do not belong to God. God is not their father if they do wrong and they're not chastened of the Lord. Anybody that is a child of God will be chastened of the Lord. Go with me very quickly to Judges. I want you to look at Judges. This is a, I laugh every time I read Judges. Back up in your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I want you to remember that even though God says, I will surely, what are the last three words? I will surely do thee good. He does promise that. He does say that. I want you to know there will be times you will have trouble in your life. And there will be times that God will tell you he's going to do you good and you don't see any good coming. But it's coming. It is coming. You know when uh, Joseph was thrown in prison. Was Joseph thrown in prison because he had done anything bad? No, he had done right. And was thrown in prison. And he was in prison for 17 years. Do you think there were any times during those 17 years that he was in prison? Do you think Joseph ever wondered, how can anything good come out of this? Well, it did. God brought good out of it. God blessed him abundantly. God lifted him up. Remember this scripture from Psalm 30 and verse 5. The psalmist says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night. You know what Joseph did a lot of while he was in prison? He did a lot of weeping, but you know what happened? The Lord lifted him up and blessed him abundantly, and joy came in the morning. Who gave him that joy? Who performed the miracle of delivering him from prison? Who lifted him up? God did. God was fulfilling his promise that he gave in Genesis 32, 12, where he says, I will surely do thee good. In Job's life, Job was doing right, serving God, keeping the commandments, fearing God, shunning evil, and trouble came in abundance in his life. Is that true? Was the Lord doing him good there? Okay, heads are going in both directions. The Lord was doing him good. He became much stronger. And in the end of his life, he says in Psalm four, uh, Job 42 verse 5, he says, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. And then the word of God says in the latter part of that chapter, after God told Job to pray for his friends, the Lord said, the Bible says the Lord gave Job much more than he'd ever had before. Did he bless the latter end of Job? Did he bless him abundantly? Did he surely do Job good? We don't have time. I encourage you to go home and read Judges chapter 6 verses 12 and 13 and, and many, many other scriptures. Let me give you one other scripture in closing. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, listen please to verse 11. I want you to know that even when you do good or when you do bad, when you do bad and God chastens you, I, know, I want you to know that it's for your good. Because when God chastens you, David makes this statement. It is in Psalm 119.71. David says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, listen in closing to verse 11. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Anybody ever enjoyed a whipping when you were growing up? Not me. Not me. I dreaded it. It was a horrible experience. I never had a good experience while I was being with Brother Walter, you had any good whippings? Well, you just said, thank you, Daddy. I, I just enjoy enjoying this so much. 
uh, whippings are chastening is a very unpleasant experience. And it says here, God says, no chastening for the present that is right then seemeth to be joyous but grievous. That's what it is. Nevertheless, after it, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable what? It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So what does God tell us in that verse of scripture? That even chastening is for our good. Is God doing us good when he chastens us? Yes he is. It brings forth peaceable fruit to them who are exercised thereby. May God help us to know and understand God's going to do you good. If you're his child he's going to do you good. He will do you good. He will surely do you good. May God help us to rejoice in that truth is my prayer for Christ's sake.